boom welcome back to mind pump you know there's a lot of diets out there and people telling you oh you should eat this or no you shouldn't eat that it's confusing well we have the answers for you we have nine ways that you can determine what are the best foods for you for your health and fitness by the way, if you want short clips on how to build muscle, how to lose fat, workout programming, and a lot of other topics, we have playlists for you over at our Mind Pump Clips YouTube channel. Make sure to go over there and check it out and subscribe. All right, enjoy the show. The best diet for you is the best diet for you. It's not the best diet for somebody else. In other words, diets can be extremely individual. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the things you should pay attention to to help you decide what foods are best for you as an individual, best for your fitness, best for your performance, and best for your health. Are you going to clip that, Andrew? Best, The best diets are the best diets for you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's hella deep right there. It's super. Well, <laughs> you know why? Yeah, you, well, you know why? Diets are, are I, gotta think about I, I mean, that. they're massively individual. I mean, how many times did you guys have to get hit with this with clients? Yeah, yeah. Where a client would follow... And look, by the way, this is why you'll you'll have a friend that follows one diet. Let's say it's keto. Then you have another friend that follows another diet. Let's say it's vegan, and both of them are like yeah. they feel good. They're healthy. This one's diet's amazing. Great for me. One's super inappropriate for the other person. Yeah, it's just like you know, you you hear all these different diets and all these different people saying this is the best thing in the world. You've got studies showing and supporting so many different diets. And it can be quite challenging to figure out, well, which one's kind of best for me and what's going on. And the problem is people really don't know what to pay attention to or how to judge what works best for them, except for maybe calories and macros and weight on the scale, which those will tell you some stuff, but they they scratch the surface, right? They barely scratch the surface. There's so much more you want to look at in terms of kind of determining what works best for you. What I like about... Uh what you built in this episode is it reminds me of kind of like the, the journey I had as a, as a coach and trainer, I, you know, uh, quickly I realized like how many, I mean, it seemed like at least early on in my career, it felt like every year there was like a new gimmick diet that yeah. was getting popular and traction. And, and so quickly I was like, Oh, this is stupid, you know? And like, look at all these people falling for this. And I was really, uh, I was really adverse to even even looking into it or utilizing anything from it. I was like anti all of it. And then I then then I had enough people where I saw that like you know that they went vegan and it was like life changing for them or you know or you know they before keto was popular they were you know doing um uh, what you call it zone or uh, no 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 Atkins, Atkins. Atkins. thank you, you Atkins and it was like life changing for them and so. It's like, and and you know, when you get somebody who it's like changed their life like that, like try telling that person, oh, your, your diet's stupid or it's, you know, so, yeah. so I had to like, okay, accept that. Okay. There are some cases here that have really, really helped these people out by switching to this, this sort of diet. And then I, then I started to go a little bit deeper on all the different diets and realize that uh, there, we have all these different uh, scenarios and cases where uh, these diets are very applicable to some people and some, some groups. And then I'm like, okay, well, how do I apply this as a coach and a trainer? So what I started to do was actually teach the methods all of them. But then I would set the table with my client on why we're doing this and what the, what the whole idea of this was. And what to look out for. Yeah, and, and the things that you listed off are literally the things that I would tell them, like, this is what we're going to do this diet, and I and I want you to follow the protocol, and I, I want you to give me the feedback on all these things. Also, tell me how much you're enjoying it and you like it, too. Like, yeah. I want to know that, too, right? Yeah, so each one, and I went through that same process with a lot of different clients because you – you find like one, like say it's the Mediterranean diet or whatever. And like this worked really well with like the majority of my clients, like initially. And, uh, and so then I tried to apply that same, uh, formula for all the rest of the next clients coming in. And then it just didn't have the same effect. And so trying to tease that out, but, you know, revisiting it later on in my career and like going through all the different types of diets and, and kind of, you know, uh, navigating through all that, you start to realize there's characteristics between each of these types of diets and like what benefits they provide might be a little bit different and might apply, you know, specifically to somebody else, um, you know, that's seeking those very specific type of characteristics. Like I need something that's a little more digestible, like a, that's addressing my food intolerances. That's, you know, uh, you know, like super like 
specific individual things that you you identify from those diets uh, that I can then pass on. Well, this is the conclusion that I came to, and and then I and I real and then what I found was really important though because and I, I probably made mistakes early on of not communicating it well enough was that I would teach somebody something and then they would go through that same process of like, oh my God, it's life changing. I love this, you know, whatever diet, insert whatever diet. And I realized I'd quickly have to explain them like, no, 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 it's not the diet. It's that you were eating this way. These types of foods didn't agree with you and you didn't mm-hmm. realize it until we eliminated them in the diet. Your body needed more of these foods over here. And then you didn't feel that good until we added it. Mm-hmm. And so really it's less about this diet is what did it for you. It's that these foods that are that we were ignoring before or these foods that you were allowing in the diet, that is what was affecting this. And so that's the real takeaway from here is not that you need to live in this box for the rest of your life and say you're a so-and-so, whatever you're, you know, and again, insert diet. It's more about what did you learn about those right. you know, specific oh, I foods. I need to up my fiber intake. Yeah, right. That's what I uh, learned from this diet. Exactly. So, yeah. I, look, there's no two people are identical. Okay. No two people are, not even identical twins, by the way, are identical. They still have different experiences and food Food, our relationship to food and how it affects us is actually extremely complex. So let's start with physiology. Your physiology is unique. You have a microbiome, for example, that's unique. So how you digest foods, your immune system is unique. How it reacts or doesn't react to certain foods, okay? Um, Your psychology is unique. Is psychology an important factor when it comes to diet? Yeah, you better believe it, right? How you feel how foods affect you. What about the connections you have with foods? Like Mm -hmm. I have certain connections to foods that you guys don't have because you didn't grow up eating those types of foods, right? Or how about this? Here's a good example of that. Like uh, you ever eat something that you always eat, but then for some reason it makes you sick once and then you can never eat it again for years, right? So that means that connection, that psychological connection to that food might've changed. Food relationships are extremely unique. So you're a unique individual. And although, although, humans were all generally very similar, especially when you compare us to other animals, we're very, very similar. We're also extremely unique. And if we don't pay attention to all these factors we're about to talk about, what you'll be stuck in is this, let me follow this diet, let me follow this diet, let me follow this diet, and not really knowing what you don't know because you don't know what to pay attention to. And you fall in this in and out type of thing, this I'm on the wagon, off the wagon, I gain weight, I lose weight, I feel good, I don't feel good, or I feel good right now, and then this diet stopped working. All of a sudden, I don't right. feel good anymore. What the hell is going on? Because everything I just said, as unique as you are physiologically, psychologically, the connections and your food relationship, those change as you get older and as the circumstances and context of your life changes as well. Whole nother layer of complexity we just added. There. That's right. So you may be thinking or hearing this right now, going, well, how the hell do I figure this out? That sounds really complex and it changes. So once I figure it out, I got to figure it out again. Well, yes and no. Yes, it's complex. However, we're about to explain to you and go over really simple things to pay attention to that are actually, in the long term, more important than uh, many of the things that you're told to pay attention to when it comes to food. So first off, I don't want to discredit things like calories and proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Those are obviously very important. But I, So I'm not going to discredit those. But what we're about to go through when it comes to long-term success actually plays a bigger role in finding the diet that works best for you and finding the one that's going to work for you for the rest of your life. But you know, I don't you know, I don't even think that statement exists. In fact, I'm going to say something that's going to be very un- unpopular or controversial, which is I think if you have landed on a diet and you think it's the best diet for you and you've stayed there, you're you're I think you're being misled. Mm. Because what I have seen in the past that has happened time and time again is okay, just a minute an example of like the, the the fiber. So let's let's go down that way. So I have a client, their digestion is off and so like that, and they uh, and I put them on the vegan diet, right? And they go and we go vegan, and oh my god, digestion has never been great before. And then okay, well, it was because they were eating like no no fruits and vegetables, they weren't getting hardly any fiber in their diet, and so now that but. What now dramatically shifted was now protein became like a really challenging thing, but they don't feel these effects not immediately. Right, not yet, right. It takes sometimes months, sometimes years of eating this way and being depleted, you know, and not quite hitting your RDA on a regular basis for a long time before 
the the hair starts to kind of fall out or skin feels weird or they can't build muscle or something doesn't feel right about their body and they don't connect it to the diet because the diet made them feel so amazing initially. Yep. So I feel like this never stops. Like I'm never, I, I don't land on like, oh, this is how I eat. This is what has made me feel. Okay, for the time being, this has made me feel better than anything else. We can say that. But it's more about investigating the foods that you're eating and how they're affecting what you. What a and good then, point. And then being aware that it may be temporarily making you feel better than what you did before, but also making sure you're watching out that, okay, now something else serving you. you might not be, that yeah. might be getting neglected. Yes, that's such a good point. I mean, to take it even a step further, I mean, you could have a nutrient deficiency um, like magnesium. Change your diet to get a lot of magnesium. Feel amazing until you're eating too much magnesium because your body stores it. Now it becomes too much magnesium. Now it becomes uh, detrimental. So what we're about to talk to you are the things to pay attention to that will always keep you on track, that'll, that'll help you find the perfect diet for your body. When you find the perfect diet for your body, you feel the best, you get the best results, and it's the easiest to stick to. It's all three of those things. And really what we're about to talk about isn't as much as pay attention to these things. It's literally just don't ignore these things because mm -hmm. the ones I'm about to go through, oftentimes we ignore because we're paying attention to the scale only, to the gym only, and maybe only to macros and calories. And we ignore these other ones. Yo, what's up everybody? Here's the giveaway. MAPS 15, the new program we just launched 15 minutes a day with an advanced version. For those of you that like to work out with barbells and really like to build strength, it's a daily short workout program. You've heard us talk about on the podcast why this could be so valuable. Well, this is the program. You get it for free, but you got to do the following. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we pick your comment. We'll notify you in the comment section that you won MAPS 15 for free. Now, everybody else, these are the final hours for the MAPS 15 launch sale. That means you get the program for $20 off. Plus, you get the two free ebooks with it The Power of Sleep and the Occlusion Training Guide. So, MAPS 15, $20 off, plus the two free ebooks. You only have a few hours left for this promotion. So, if you're interested, head over to maps15minutes.com and then use the coupon code 15 special for the discount and the free ebooks. All right, here comes the show. So, let's start with the first one. This one's the most important, which is digestibility. There's a, there's a saying that is, um, you are what you eat. It's actually not true. You are what you digest. That's what you are. If your body can't properly break something down or if what you eat, and I don't care what the food is, it could be the greatest superfood in the planet. If it causes inflammation, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, or an immune response, that food is not only not right for you, it's actually bad for you. To, to use an extreme example... Um, a healthy food, think of a very healthy food like uh, eggs or um, a, a fruit like vegetable, like, like strawberries, right? Well, if you're allergic to those foods, it goes from a healthy food to don't eat this or you'll die, right? right? That's an extreme case. But it could be as easy as, you know, I get a little heartburn or I feel a bit inflamed or this makes me feel lethargic. For some reason, this causes a blood sugar crash, which by the way is very individual. We're learning this now with these continual uh, glucose I'm, I'm also going to add to that to make this even more complex, but it also sometimes can be a food that didn't bother you for a very long time. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then now it's something that you've consumed. And this is what I think is most common, most common. Yeah, but this never bothered me before. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Because I've been eating this my whole life. How could it be that? It can't be that food. Well, it's, it absolutely can be Look, that. Look, anybody over the age of 30 knows that the foods that they could eat before are not the same no. as the foods that they could eat uh, now. So digestibility is extremely, extremely important. Digestibility is more important than food quality. What do you mean by food quality? Well, uh, protein quality or how many essential or, fatty acids are in there. Or organic or not. Or, yeah, or, or vitamins and minerals or organic. Well, if you can't break it down properly and if it causes inflammation and bloating, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that the quality in a lab is shown to be better. If it affects your body poorly digest, you know, with your digestion, it's not going to be good for you. So what are the things to look out for? Well, um, do you have really bad flatulence? Does it smell really bad? Do you have bad stool, right? Are you not passing good stool? Is it painful? Is it constipated? Is it diarrhea? Do you have heartburn? Mm. Do, you, do you get skin issues? Oftentimes skin issues, 
from food uh, come from digestion type issues. So am I getting rashes or dryness or oiliness? Like these are all things to pay attention to. And even if the food that you're eating is supposedly a super healthy food, if it causes digest digestion issues, then don't eat it. And on the flip side, if you eat something that just digests so well, where you eat it and you're like, oh my God, that just, I feel like I, 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 I even though I'm satisfied, I feel like I eat air. It's just, I don't feel bloated. My digestion's incredible. That's a good food. That's a good food. Yeah, because look at all the downstream effects that causes. I mean, it it, it gets it finds its way into your sleeping patterns. Oh, yeah. It finds its way into your recovery, into your performance in the gym, um, performance at work, the way that you think, the way you walk around during the day, your self confidence. Like it's there's so many psychological factors to that. So uh, and you don't really know that until you've really focused on just consuming foods that are easily digestible and like how you can then, you know, move forward and thrive uh, with that type of energy. You also said something at the beginning that I think is important that it makes it easier for people to, um, you know, adhere to, right. To stick to this diet. If it's, if it's a diet that feels good or checks some of these boxes that we're talking about. Right. And I mean, this is something that just like list literally happened this last week. Um, you know, Katrina and I have been uh, busy. We've had some long nights where we didn't get a, a lot of rest. Uh, she, we've talked about it before. She obviously listens to the show, so she knows I've shared where, you know, when your lack of sleep, those when the cravings kick up, mm -hmm. her go-to thing, her, her go-to thing is five guys, five guys and French fries. That's like a, a major treat in our house. It's normally her who, who brings it up and says she wants it. I normally say, yeah, if we haven't had it in a while, I'm down to have it. Um, I knew that we had been uh, inconsistent with our sleep for the week. I also knew that I only had one day of training in the last three or four days at that point. And she's like, oh, burger. What, can we do burgers? And I'm like, no, I just, and I'll tell you what, what makes me say no is I actually can, I can visually imagine what I feel like after I eat it. it boy, going down, it is amazing. Yeah. And I, and so initially I think that like, oh, that does sound good right now. You're right. That sounds good. But what I instantly switch over to is the like, but every time I do that, it feels like a rock is just sitting in my stomach. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it normally will throw my stool off and I won't feel good for another good 24 hours after that. Switch over to what we had, which was bison, sweet potato, and just some onions, some of my boring bodybuilding type of diet food. And, you know, going down doesn't have that same burger juicy taste, but like you mentioned, it felt like air. Like I, mm -hmm. I felt satisfied. I have no longer hungry, but didn't, it felt so good afterwards. And so learning to connect those things is so important to, to making that choice. Cause it's hard to make that choice when you feel like that, especially if you're tired and the cravings are, are strong and you haven't ate yet. But this to me is one of the biggest keys to being successful with making good food choices yes. is, is exactly being able to connect these dots. When your digestion's off, you're more inflamed. You have higher levels of stress hormones, lower levels of the anabolic uh, rebuilding hormones. Sleep becomes worse. Blood sugar becomes more erratic. Uh, it affects lots and lots of different things. Cravings go up. So di poor digestion makes you either not hungry at all and then when that goes away, cravings uh, go through the roof. So it's the most important thing to consider. Now, here's the thing. Most people, it's not even that they don't think that they don't think about digestion. They ignore it. They'll follow a diet. I had people would follow keto diet when that became popular. And they'd be like, hey, when is the constipation going to go away? Like, well, <laughs> it's probably not for minute. you, right? Yeah. It's probably not for you. I don't think you should eat it. Or I'm following this great diet. And I've lost lots of weight. You know, I've got this terrible heartburn, but it's okay because I take Prilosec or whatever every single day. And it's like, well, it's not... It's not working for you, right? Yeah. So digestion's number one. Here's the second one, energy. Not just long-term energy, but also immediate energy. If you eat something and you notice that an hour or two later, you feel um, <clears throat> sluggish or yeah. tired or you need to take a nap. So this happens to me when I eat a large serving, especially a large Pancakes. serving yeah. of, <laughs> of, uh, of, of gluten-containing carbohydrates. <clears throat> so if I eat like a pasta mm -hmm. or bread, um, and I love, I mean, my family's from Italy. I love pasta. I love bread. I know about an hour to two later, I'm, I need to take a nap. I feel so lethargic. I feel so tired. I have to either take caffeine or go and take a nap. Now, long-term energy, this one obvious, right? So if you're following a diet over time, you start to feel less and less energetic. You feel more and more lethargic. And by the way, feeling lethargic and low energy, it will stir up cravings because your body's trying to seek something 
to get you to pick up again a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, now, we have um, CGMs now, continual glucose monitors that people can wear. And this is giving us some ideas as to what's going on with energy with some people. And this is very individual. Somebody could wear a CGM. And so what that does, it measures glucose in the blood. And they could eat oatmeal or they could eat, um, you know, ice cream. So you would think, well, oatmeal is going to be much better on blood glucose than ice cream. Well, for the most part, that's true. But there's cases, and we've seen this, where it's not. The oatmeal causes the crazy spike and drop. So somebody in this case might ignore that because they're like, but I, oatmeal is healthy. Everybody says oatmeal is really good. And and so I don't know why I'm tired. I don't know what's going on, right? So not paying attention to these things means you're going to continue to push yourself down the wrong path. Have you guys identified foods for yourselves like that? For yeah, me, it's gluten for sure. It's very similar to you. Um, and I was just thinking about what was funny was was how uh, we used to load so much with with those types of carbs before games, thinking that mm. we were doing yeah. ourselves a service. And I would get to the game, I'd be so lethargic and tired and was always battling that once I got into the game and uh, didn't find, like figure that out till way later on in my career. Uh, whereas I could have been a lot sharper, a lot more energetic if I would have just got better sources of carbohydrates, like say even like r white rice for me or potatoes as, as a different source versus, um, you know, having like something like, like a gluten filled, like pancake, like I'd mentioned or, or pasta. So um, yeah, that was, that was a very interesting um, uh, shift for me is to, you know, you go through that and you figure out which and you, types of carbs. And you ignored it for well. a long time. Yeah. Because everybody told you you're supposed to eat it. Completely crash. It would be like so tired. I want to go to sleep. That's the so point. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick with, for the audience, I'm going to stick with the analogy that is like so recent for me that it, because I just went through it and I, and as we're having this conversation and I, and I know the, the bullet points that are coming up, it's interesting because I'm, I'm going like, this is so funny because uh, obviously I, we're having to articulate this right now. But this whole conversation happens in my head when when this moment comes on. Mm. When the wife says, let's go have five guys. Sounds hella good to me. And then right away, my brain starts thinking of like, you know, oh, I haven't done this, I haven't done that. Oh, I'll feel this way, I'll feel that way. This way. And, and this is all happening, even to this point, the energy, right? So at that point, it's like, I think five or six o'clock at the night. Um, I know at the end of the end of the night, one of my routines is like clean the house and move the cars. I straighten everything mm -hmm. up. I do the dishes. And it's like, if I have that, that burger meal, I know exactly what I normally want to do. That's normally what I like to do. Like on Friday nights after house is all clean done. Cause I know I don't fucking want to move. It makes me just, it not yep. only does it sit like a rock, but then I just want to plop down on the couch and just be a, a vegetable. And I know that's part of that process. If I choose to go down that path, it's like, and so here we are in the middle of a weekday. I've got things to do still. The house isn't clean completely. And we eat that way too. Not only am I going to feel that way, but I also know that I'm not going to have the energy to want to do the stuff that I really do, which also will put me in a bad mood after that. So it's like all these things and I'll touch on all of them as we get the list. Like that conversation happened in my head yeah, same. to yeah. make that decision. Same. All right. So this next one is going to seem obvious, but I listed it because what I'm about to say is not so obvious. So this is palatable. All right, what does that mean? How enjoyable is the food for you to eat? So you might be thinking, well, yeah, no shit. Like uh, I definitely choose foods based off of how, how much I enjoy them. Okay, here's why I listed palatability. Palatability isn't just flavor. So when people think something palatable, they think it's just the taste. Palatability includes the experience and how much you enjoy eating whatever you're eating. So it's not just the taste. It's also the texture. It's also the mouthfeel. It's also the connection. It's also the memories. It's also all, it's all those things. For example, that bison dish you were talking about, you probably find more palatable because you know how good it makes you feel. Mm. So you want it more because of that. So paying attention to all the other things we're going to talk about will actually change the palatability of certain foods. So the reason why I listed this is, yes, you want to definitely think about the foods you enjoy eating, but also think how you can make the foods that make you feel good more enjoyable by connecting the dots to all these other I've, incredible things. I've made, that's why I brought up that. And I said that, you know, um, my, my boring bodybuilder food, but I have now made the connection of, uh, you know, there's a handful of, you know, consistent dishes that mm -hmm. I ate and, you know, bison, sweet potato and onions is one of them with just some seasoning on it is like one of the staple. So I have this connection of not only does that, did that feel good going down, by the way, when you're dieting that strict, that is like sweet potato and it's like mm -hmm. those, that's a rich, a, a rich meal for me. So being able to have something that I know I like uh, to, to in replace of um, 
the uh, burger and fries was a, was a must for me. If I, it'd be a re- even more difficult for me if I didn't have an, an alternative option of a, a good choice for my body that I actually like also. So I th- it does play a factor in that. Like if we had, if Katrina is like, well, we have nothing at the house or, you know, all we have is chicken breasts and, or tilapia and asparagus. It would have been much harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would have been much harder to do that. But I, I love the bison and sweet potatoes. So it's, it was an easy, like, you know what? I'm going to feel so much better. I'll feel better yes. after it while I'm doing it. The day after, after I'm, I eat it, like, let's go that route. Palatability is a value. Value. It's a real value of food. It's an important one, but on its own, it's not very good because it doesn't take into a lot of other things mm. uh, into account. So, but we do want to be quite honest, and palatability is very important. So, let's talk about an extreme case here. You're following a diet, and you hate <laughs> the experience of eating all the food. I, right. I mean, doesn't, nothing else matters at that point, right? Yeah, nothing matters. The, and it, but the the silver lining to it is you can actually you know, build those associations. You can actually increase your desire. Like it'll taste better at the end of the day. Once you like build those firm associations that this, you know, helps me to digest food a lot more effectively. And I I feel better overall in general um, when I eat these foods. And so as I'm doing that, I'm consuming it and I'm kind of reiterating that to my mind. So, I mean, and this is like, you've mentioned before too, like I've had a hard time with fish and, you know, and that's just something I'm just like constantly (laughs) like still like really trying to program my mind to, to be like, okay, this is good. You know, I need, I need the megas from this. I, I need like the health benefits from this, the nutrients, like this is, this is doing things for me. So that way too, like the flavor of it actually kind of changes. Yeah. And you know, it's funny now you might not be able to work miracles, but I bet you, um, cause Justin hates fish or hated fish. I bet you didn't go from hate to love, but you probably went from hate to I can tolerate. Yeah. So, and that's the key. That's the thing that I'm talking about. So yeah, you're not going to be able to take a food that's super gross yeah, exactly. and all of a sudden make it like taste good, but you may take something that at first you didn't like and then make it into something that, well, I can eat this. I can actually eat this. But palatability, again, it's very important. It's a real value. So you definitely want to consider it. And by the way, you can improve the palatability of most foods. Very simple with salt, seasonings, and if you don't mind adding calories, olive oil. Olive oil makes almost anything that's healthy fat taste better. And salt, yeah. Seriously, those, and those are one those those two things, salt and fat, right there, thrown on on onto foods will make a big difference. That that'll increase the power. You know, we're talking about the positive things with, with with good good healthy choices and stuff like that. But you have me thinking about something that I think most people have experienced. Most anybody I've ever met that drank beer for the first time or drank wine for oh, the yeah. first time. Yeah. Did not like it. I've never heard anyone go like, oh, man, the first time I had a glass of wine, it was so <laughs> Nobody amazing. Nobody liked my, it. Right? So Especially it's, beer. So what is it? What is it that made us lo- eventually love, love it, right? We've learned to attach positive associations to that thing enough times that it, you eventually ended up not only so liking true. it, but yeah. loving it, right? right? So it goes both ways. Same thing with black yeah. coffee. You're training yourself <laughs> to like it. Black, black coffee, too. I don't know anybody that drank black coffee for the first time was like, mmm, this is delicious. Uh-huh. Most people are like, oh, this is gross. And then you get the caffeine and the effects, and all of a sudden you start to like the taste. Yeah. <laughs> start out with frappuccinos, you're working exactly. with the nitros. Okay? Exactly. Yeah. All right, so this next one, it's another one that's important, and you have to, um, you know, you have to validate this, and that's your emotional connection, both good and bad to food. I gave an example <laughs> earlier where you eat something, you get sick, all of a sudden you don't want that food anymore because it reminds you of, of when you got sick, right? That's the power of something like this. Here's, here's something else. There's probably foods that you have a good connection to that you ate as a kid that if you were really honest with yourself and you just got introduced to them for the first time as an adult, they're not that good. <laughs> but the reason why you like them- Like is, Kraft mac and cheese. Yeah. Bleh. Or that, Twinkies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, but, but because you have a connection to those things, mm-hmm. they actually, you know, you kind of enjoy them. By the way, uh, food manufacturers do this all the time. This is why we crave popcorn at the movie theater or, you know, there's birthday foods and stuff like that. So emotional connection is very important. And it's important to highlight the good and the bad connections that you have to food because this will help you become, remember, all all the things that we're talking about is going to help you develop a much broader, complete view mm-hmm. of the values of food for your body and emo- the emotional connection that you have to foods. By the way, here's another one, okay? Do I, here's some of the bad potential emotional connections. When I'm stressed, what foods do I reach for? Yeah. Mm-hmm. When I'm sad, when I'm anxious, what about when I'm bored? What are the foods that I reach for? What about when I'm happy or I feel confident or what, when I feel insecure? Pay attention to these patterns because what you you may uncover is that you may uncover that your 
either numbing yourself or self-medicating yourself or eating foods, maybe not so much because you want the foods, but because of the emotional state that you're in. And that can help prevent things like impulsive eating or using food as a drug, which, I mean, that's the most commonly abused drug in, in, in Western societies is food. No, this is exactly, I actually pointed it out and she, she knew because when she when she asked me, you know, do you want to have five guys? And it, again, I'm processing all this stuff. And I look back at her and said, you do know why you want that, right? And she goes, I know. She goes, 100%. She goes, I haven't slept. We've had stressful days back then. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I, to me, it's just that the first step is becoming, is the point you're making, which is becoming aware of how how powerful the psychology is that, you know, you, you tend to gravitate to certain things based off of these emotional connections that we have and or stress and or lack of sleep and being aware of that makes it easier for you to make a better choice because you're, you're on, Oh wow. That's, it's not just cause I want it cause I deserve it or it's a good time to have it. It's because these other factors are playing a role now. And do I have the mental discipline to make the better choice? Yeah. Here's an example of emotional connection when it, when, for me, it outweighs some of the other ones. Now, it usually doesn't, and it's usually a blend of things. And, the, and then the, the, the situation in my life or the context of what's going on, some maybe are more valuable than others. And that's what's wonderful about this is as you go through these and pay attention to these, some will be more important depending on the circumstances. My digestion's bad. Well, then the digestibility is going to be much more important. Um, I'm at my mom's house for Sunday dinner. Guess what matters? Very important to me, my emotional connection. You know, I just talked about how gluten containing carbohydrates make me feel like crap. But when mom is making homemade pasta sauce and homemade lasagna, my emotional connection to that food with my family is so important to me and it's so valuable to me that I'll trade one for the other. It's not only just that. So I, one of the things I, I, I love that we've done since the beginning that we've, we've started this thing is we've always been very transparent and honest with our, our audience because... Um, we're not trying to sell you this idea or image. It's a, it's a lifestyle, and it doesn't mean that I don't choose the burger. That's right. I do choose the. There's been plenty of times where I choose the mm -hmm. burger. So there's there's lots of times where that's what it does look like. It's Friday. Katrina and I had a killer week. We crushed it. We trained three or four times. Like we handled all kinds of bullshit in our relationship. We killed it. Like her and I are about to sit down and watch a good movie or binge something that we hadn't watched. It's like yeah. I'm going to let it sit like a rock in my stomach today. <laughs> I'm going to have a bad shit tomorrow. Like, you know, <laughs> because I'm going to, and I'm going to enjoy that burger going down because I want it right now. And so the, the, the problem is, and I think is that, uh, people justify that too much or ignore all the things we're talking about. And the real secret to all this is just, is having the awareness and learning to have balance well, in your what life. This, exactly. What this leads to is balance, mm -hmm. right? This leads to balance. And and that's why there's so many of these. And that's why it's important to pay attention to all of these. Yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to bring up is just like when, um, you know, we allow some of these emotional foods, like, to get too much hype. So like in terms of like, this is again, my problem with cheat meals and all these things, we're, we're putting too much emphasis good, in, good point. In, um, on our availability of like, I I get to have this, I get to have this. And it, it just becomes like one of these things where we just completely indulge and, uh, you know, go excessive and overboard. I, yeah. I, I spoke out since day one on that when I first got on social media. and the, So I didn't even know that was a thing until I got into the competitive world. Yeah. The whole like- uh, The idea cheat, of cheat meals is so- Cheat meal, cheat day thing was never- a So th ridiculous. Yeah, I didn't know any, I've never heard that in my life for the first 10 years of a trainer. It wasn't until the back 10 when I got into the competitive world that this becomes and the minute I I saw it and heard it, I was I was against it because mm -hmm. it just it's so obvious to me what you're doing. You are you're not addressing a good relationship food. If anything, you're promoting the the binge restrict. Mm -hmm. That I mean that that mentality and that mentality. I've already seen that in clients struggle their whole life. You know, with these crazy restrictive diets and then going off. It all that is is a, is a condensed version of that. Yeah. So what people normally do is this: diet really hard for weeks or maybe months if they're really good, get in good shape, and then fall hard off the wagon. Doing a cheat day or meal or whatever you want to call it is literally building that into a week. And it's that is what you're doing. It's dysfunction. I'm, it's not flexibility. No, yes, it's no. not balance. Yeah, it's not balance. Balance would be it's a meal, right? Oh, you're eating uh, pizza right now. Yeah, it's a meal. Yeah, not my cheat meal. It's just a meal. And okay, well, you want me to break down why I'm eating it? Well, I'm connecting with my friends. We're having a good time. That's why I think it's valuable. And it's situational. It's not like you're like scheduling it. Correct. Yeah. Correct. All right. Yeah. So the next one, this one's funny to me because for a long time, and maybe even now, although I think people are starting to wise up a little bit, 
for a long time, when I would have clients that would talk about changes in their hair or their skin, and they'd go to the doctor and they'd ask them things like, could my diet be affecting my skin? Do you think my diet could be giving me acne or some of these rashes or inflammation? And the doctors would be like, no, it has nothing to do with your skin. It has nothing to do with your hair. And as a trainer who's <laughs> trained people over and over again, I was like, oh my so God, frustrating. that's so frustrating. Pay attention to your skin and hair. Your skin and hair, first off, your skin, which is the largest organ in your body, your skin, it, it, it's like a delayed reaction, but it will tell you if you're inflamed or if you have gut issues. It's actually, in fact, you go to a functional medicine practitioner with chronic skin issues, mm -hmm. one of the first things they're going to do is look at your gut. So skin and hair are actually great measures of things like nutrient deficiencies. Am I getting the right amount of fatty acids? Am I getting a good amount of protein? Do I have good digestion? Mm -hmm. so if you're, yeah. yeah, so if you're eating a particular way and your skin is like cracked or dry or oily or itchy um, and your hair is stringy, um, or not full, it doesn't feel, you know, quote unquote healthy. Um, look at your diet. Your diet may be the culprit for some of this stuff. I mean, this is, uh, this is easy for me, uh, easy because I, my autoimmune is psoriasis. So one of the quickest ways for me to know, my, I mean, anytime like someone sees my psoriasis, they're like, Oh my God, what's that? Or I, I didn't know you had that. Or yeah, it, my response always is, yeah, my diet's not dialed right now. If I'm if I'm eating out of bounds uh, more often than not, uh, it quickly uh, reminds me of that. And so to me, it's always been kind of a blessing in disguise. Of course, it, it, I, I hate it. I don't like it. It's not ideal. But it also keeps me in check because I can, it's a visual representation. It's really easy sometimes, I think, for people to ignore the stuff inside. Yep. Oh, my digestion's off. Oh, my soul. I'm just going to ignore all that stuff because I can't see it. But I see the, these visual dry spots and itchy skin on me, I and mean, it happens almost immediately. I know you say it takes a little bit while to kick in. I can eat something, and within two hours, I'm I I'm picking. Yeah, yours is more extreme. Yeah. Right, right away. I mean, within two hours. I've seen it. You've told us. You've said. You've actually pointed it out and said, "Watch what happens." Yeah, right away. I'll, it'll it'll get it'll get bad, and so um, yeah, no, absolutely affects. You know. Back to your point too about the doctor thing. That that's that still hasn't changed, unfortunately. I mean, my my dermatologist who specializes in that in the skin shit, it didn't tell me diet. I mean, that's the part that is crazy to me. It's crazy to me that even even in in the the fields that like this is your specialty is that that we weren't ever talking about diet. It was always you know what's funny about creams this? and shots. You know what's funny mm -hmm. about this uh, or medication that they're testing. You guys have dogs. Veterinarians know that the diet, the dog's diet affects their coat right. and their skin. Yeah. It's really weird how humans, are we different animals or something? Yeah, different organisms completely. I don't know about it's that. It's so strange. Yeah. All right, the next one is athletic performance. Different types of foods, different compositions of foods will affect your athletic performance differently. For me, for example, what may make me feel best digestion-wise, what may make me feel best mentally or whatever, may not be what makes me feel best athletically and vice versa. So again, this is all about balance. But for me, athletic-wise, starchy carbohydrates, usually rice, some good mm -hmm. lean proteins, and some fats, not a ton of fats. And then I just have the best athletic performance. Why is this important to pay attention to? I work out. I work out, right? I work out on a daily basis. Also, athletic performance can give you a, a nice gauge on your just overall fitness. So if I want to be stronger, feel better, have more stamina, well, there's certain foods that I'm going to eat that are going to make me feel this way. So this is definitely something you want to pay attention to if you exercise, and you should exercise. So if you exercise, pay attention, like, am I stronger? Do I feel better? Do I have more energy in my workouts? And that'll kind of lead you to the foods that do better yeah, for Yeah, this is back to the whole characteristics thing and what applies best for whatever situation or goal that you have at mm. the time. And for me, it's like, if I've been feeling like my heartburn's coming back, like all these kind of issues I'm dealing with again, like I'm going to reduce calories a bit and I'm going to focus a little bit more on up in my protein and, you know, things like that, reducing a lot of like inflammatory type carbs that I may sneak its way in. You know, I'm very much adamant about that because I know it works. And then the same thing with athletic performance. It's like, I got to beef up the calories a bit for me. And, and that, that introducing of, of carbohydrates really does help with that and aids into, you know, my lifts and my training specifically uh, a lot uh, our audience might not know this um but our good friend and partner uh jason phillips made his bones in the crossfit community by addressing this right yep. i don't know if you guys remember that or yeah because when crossfit first started it was about paleo, paleo and keto yeah yeah which yeah. is not the best diet yeah for hardcore low carbohydrate diets yeah. um 
seeds. <laughs> and it, it, and now it what originally why it stayed around for as long as it did was because you had you know r- what it did create was pretty lean bodies yeah, and, and it's then, healthy and you had yeah you had and it's healthy and you had these athletes that were still pushing through so but it was not what was optimal for athletic performance. Mm-hmm. No. And he came in and completely flipped the nutrition model on their head. That's how he got really popular. You know the was, irony of that is do you mm-hmm. know how many athletes these are athletes, by the way. So if you're watching this and you're not a highly competitive athlete, you're even at a greater disadvantage. These were athletes that were ignoring the signs that their body was telling them. They were completely ignoring their athletic just performance. Was going to shit, just pushing through it. That's why these things are so important because the average person doesn't pay attention to all these things. They'll pay attention to the scale mm-hmm. and they'll ignore all this other stuff and they wonder why they can't stick to a particular diet or why the diet doesn't work for them right. anymore. So it's really, really crazy one. Here's the next one. Sleep. This one's a big one. Your diet can have profound effects on your sleep, especially the foods that you eat that are closer to bedtime. So I know for me, for example, if I eat, when I do eat carbohydrates for me, if I want to have good sleep, I'll typically eat them about three or four hours before going to bed. Now I know people are the opposite. They have Mm -hmm. to eat low carbohydrates before bed. For me, you give me some carbs about three hours before bed. By the time bed rolls around, I have this wonderful, (laughs) nice Evening of sleep, the right types of carbohydrates oh, destroy me. Yeah, but for you, it's yeah. There you yeah, go. So there's the opposite. Variants. I have to have them all in the morning. Like, <laughs> it's just like that's. I just need as many calories as I can first thing in the morning. That really helps me set my day out with good energy. Well, this is another reason why I really like the the old advice that had been debunked and now is less popular, and that's the old don't eat past six o'clock. Mm. Um, or eat morning in the morning like a king, afternoon like a queen, like a popper, like a popper. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean that's and of course we had the, the, the science came out to debunk that's stupid. If calories are all equated this in the same and macros are the same, then it doesn't matter if you eat it at midnight or. But dude, it 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 does. It affects your sleep. You know, they're what they're measuring and testing. What's not the same is the 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 calorie burn and the metabolizing of fat, and they're they're paying attention to that. But what they're not measuring is like is sleep. You know, I bet you if you took the same person who uh, ate their the same exact calories, always stopped by six o'clock, and then they always and then that same person test them again for six months, make them eat till midnight every single night, I guarantee they would report back that their sleep was better when they ate at six. Mm -hmm. You would see that. And then if your sleep is not good, then it goes back to that thing that we talked about earlier about cravings kick up. And now it just makes it that much harder to make those good choices again. And so it's like this cycle that is really hard to tease out and test somebody in a six to eight week study and say, hey, this isn't impacting all these things. So that's why I like that. And I always try and make it a goal to get done with my eating as early as possible, six, seven o'clock, because I know I'm going to be up till 10 or 11. So I want to be, I want to have been done for a while before I lay down. And when I don't, I always notice a difference in how I feel. Yeah. And to take it a step further, people don't even know that their eating affects their sleep unless it's obvious, right? Like I just ate before bed. Oh, I feel sick. People don't realize what they ate in the morning could affect their sleep or just what they eat on a regular basis could affect their sleep. It's like if somebody has sleep issues, there's lots of things that they look at Food is almost never on the list. That's my point with this is that sleep definitely gets affected by the types of food. It's also compounding, Sal, right? So let's let's go back to my burger thing that I told you. It feels like it sits like a rock. Imagine I eat the burger. I go right to bed right afterwards. So I I eat something that doesn't agree with my digestion. Then I lay down horizontally, you know, and and, and high calorie and late at night, like, yeah, it's going to disrupt all of that. It's d- disrupting the sleep, disrupting the digestion, and to think that that doesn't make a big difference uh, long term, and then doing it over and over, and you're crazy. Totally. All right, this next one. This is extremely important because one of the biggest challenges for people who are trying to maintain a healthy body weight, right? The average person is dealing with typically dealing with, well, I'm a little heavy, or I tend to gain more body fat, or maybe I'm trying to lose body fat. So this next one is very important for these people, which is, again, most people, and that is satiety. How long do I say stay satisfied after eating particular meals? Now, I could, I know there are foods that I will eat when I'm trying to gain weight, and it's not because they're high calorie. It's because they make me, they make, I get hungry faster after I eat those foods. I know that there's certain foods that make me really satisfied for longer, and I'll choose those foods when I'm trying to eat less food. So if you're trying to bulk, for example, well, you want to pay attention to the foods that don't give you much satiety so you can fit in more calories. If you're not trying to bulk and trying to cut, well, you want to pick foods that stay with you longer. You eat it and you feel better and not so hungry. So for me, for example, 
a ketogenic diet tends to be the satiety producing one. That's for me. Okay. So high protein, by the way, for most people, high protein just increases satiety regardless. But for me, high protein ketogenic diet, I'll eat less. If I'm trying to bulk, then I'll drop the fats. I'll keep the protein high, but not as high as I had with keto. And then I'll bump the carbs. And what happens with me? I just get hungry more often. So satiety is something you want to pay attention to as well, because you need to manipulate this based on whatever your goals are. So I love this one because if you've listened to the podcast long enough, um, there was a point where the, I believe both of you, at least I know you did. I think Justin did too, had went keto. I was just coming out of competing and I was like at peak metabolism. I was 5,000 calories. I think it was hitting like 600 grams of carbs a day. I mean, and abs feeling like yeah. a champ. Right. And I mean, I could, I could eat almost anything calorie wise at that point and still stay pretty lean because my metabolism was roaring. And I remember these guys running the ketogenic diet and I'm like, why would I, I hell no, I love carbs <laughs> and I can eat all, I have this, I have this incredible metabolic flexibility to eat. All, why would I do that? And of course, uh, trying always to be as self-aware as I can. I caught myself going like, okay, well, that's why I should just simply because I said I don't need to, or I don't want to, or why would I? So, okay, why not challenge myself? What I found that I thought was so interesting and what has, it has completely changed the way I eat today than what I did the previous years before that was I recognize this. I recognize on the ketogenic diet, how hard it was actually for me to, I couldn't even hit my caloric goal. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the food, the, so the food was so the, the higher fats and the higher protein was so satiating that I couldn't get the calorie intake, mm -hmm. which told me right away after I had been doing it for a while, this is not a long-term diet for me, but it definitely went, Hmm, hmm that could maybe be useful, very useful. Things, right? So when I'm not, you know, got a 5,000, you know, calorie type of metabolism and I have more like a 3,000, 3,500 calorie metabolism right now. Boy, it's a really nice tool to have that I keep my carbs now at 150, 200. I would say 250 would be a really high day, which I would, that was when I used to carb cycle from competing. Is that your low carb day? My low carb day was 250. Wow. That was a low carb day, which has now become the highest carb day that I would have in dieting. And what I have found with that is when I target foods that are higher in protein and fat as the primary source of calories for my diet, it's just easier not to overeat. Where if I was allow carbohydrates in there, the car the carbohydrates would stimulate the appetite and it would be it would take way more discipline for me to, to restrict. Mm -hmm. And so it's made for a better balance for that. Now I didn't go adopt keto and say this was the best thing for me, but I took some of the, the things that I learned from going through that and have now modified my current diet. Yeah, and remember, keep in mind, we're talking about our personal experiences. These are very individual because I know people who go higher fat, lower, lower carbohydrate, and it affects their digestion so poorly, and then they feel terrible, or people who just get low energy on it. So again, this is all super individual. We're just giving our own personal experiences. But satiety, definitely something you want to pay attention to. And the data does show that high protein, irrespective of carbohydrates and fats, is very, very satiety producing. So if you're trying to get lean, you should probably experiment with a high protein diet regardless, because that'll probably help you out. Not everybody, but most likely it probably will. All right, the last one, here's the last one. Adam, you added this one at the very end, and I think I'm, I'm glad you did, because this kind of takes into account all the things that we just talked about, which is adherence, your ability to stay consistent on said diet. So if you're following a diet that feels incredible, gives you great energy, good digestibility, good athletic performance, um, good sleep, all this other stuff, but it's like this rare marsupial from Brazil that you have to eat you know, <laughs> three times a day, you're not going to be able to stick to it, right? So it's not a good diet. Now, I'm using an extreme example, but adherence is very important. Can you stick to this diet or is it so inconvenient or is it one that just so doesn't work with you or it's one that doesn't make you feel good, whatever? You have to consider all of that because at the end of the day, the diet that you that you can't stick to is one that doesn't work for you. It's just the bottom like a line. Tasmanian right? Tasmanian tiger, like what kind of? <laughs> yeah, what are we talking about well, here? it's re very similar to uh, the the little tagline you always say about uh, inferior programs, right? Like a inferior program done consistently is better than a superior program done inconsistently. Uh, the same thing about a diet. There could be a better diet for you out there. But if you'll never stick to it, you don't mm -hmm. like it. It, 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 it doesn't the, matter. It doesn't matter. You're better off doing a diet that is less optimal for you, but at least better because you're going to adhere to it. So, I think that's always got to be so. Which is why, you know, coming full circle in my 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 coaching uh, experience, 
the towards the end of my career, the way putting together diets for clients looked like was I didn't build any diets. I said, yeah. you go eat how you always eat. And I don't, I literally, if that means eating Skittles at two on certain days, do it. If that means going through McDonald's, do it. I want to see how you eat on a regular basis from there. I'm going to make subtle modifications to it and move you in the direction that I know is probably going to be healthier for you. And pay attention to all and, this stuff. And exactly. And then help them make the connections on all these things. It's that better to tighten little screws and, and, you know, get you closer to your goal that way. I had the same experience where it was just like, I had to throw away all the meal planning. Like that was just a big part of like personal training it was like, here's your meal plan. Here's like yep. the, the, the list that you're allowed to get and like, let's avoid these foods. And it's just like, it's such a, a stark contrast of what they're already doing to where it's, it's like steering a, a, a big, huge, you know, steering wheel versus just like making these like tiny little uh, changes that they're more likely to do and and are actually going to move the needle so much further so yeah i would just take them to the to the grocery store and we would shop how they would shop and i would just watch you know the behaviors okay they're going to go for this type of a food you know and then maybe be like look at the back and read the label maybe let's try this one you know and then just make like one or two little subtle changes and it would go so much further that's perfect yeah so basically if you follow and listen to all these different factors you can start to begin to develop a balanced approach to nutrition and ultimately find the best diet that works for you, which will lead to the best results. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can only find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. This one's really important and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps. If you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're gonna see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.